The British had a global empire and were the ruler of the seas, and the sun never set on the British Empire, while Hitler was a nationalist wanting only what was good for Germany. And to Hitler, Germany was where German was spoken, or had once been spoken. After the Roman Empire had fallen to the Germans, the Holy Roman Empire picked up where Rome left off, and the Romans had separated from the Christian Church in Constantinople to become the western half of Christianity, while the eastern half was called Greek Orthodox, and they kept their pope in Constantinople. Greek Orthodox would later be called Russian Orthodox when the pope in Constantinople moved up to Moscow. And the Pope in Rome invented the title of Holy Roman Emperor because he wanted someone to be powerful enough to oppose the Pope in Constantinople. Charlemagne marched through the Alps from Schwabia to conquer northern Italy for the Pope in 773 AD, and Charlemagne was crowned the first Holy Roman Emperor on Christmas Day in the year 800, and each Pope in Rome would decide thereafter who would be the next Holy Roman Emperor for the next 1,000 years. Charlemagne had a dream that his kingdom was fed by four rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, the Nile and the Danube, and that meant a lot to people reading the book of Enoch that had been a favorite of the original twelve apostles. When Jesus was walking the earth, German forts held back the Romans from getting across the Danube. So Germany was deprived of the benefit of Roman civilization, and by 200 A.D., Germans lived from the North Sea to the Black Sea and were sharing a border with Rome. Hitler wanted to be the next Roman, Holy Roman Emperor, but it was something of a race between the British and Hitler, although the British were more aggressive and had been practicing the business of empire a lot longer than Hitler. 1935 was a great year for the emergence of local self-help groups such as the early Nazis and some others that have remained in history anonymous. And when Hitler was appointed as the Chancellor of Germany, it just so happened that the Bishop of Berlin was the Cardinal's Secretary of State for the Vatican, and his name was Pacelli, and he signed a pact with Hitler on the 20th of July in 1933, and the pact was called the Concordant of Rome. Pacelli became the Pope in March of 1939, so that was close enough to call Hitler's Führership a divine appointment by God, and Pacelli changed his name to Pius XII, and Charlemagne Schwabia had become Bavaria, and the descendants of Charlemagne had been ruling in Hanover until they became the British royal family in 1714 with their new House of Hanover. England was an island whose first name was Albion, a name given them by sailors from the Middle East who'd come looking for tin. And when the Romans came to England around 50 B.C., they called it Britannia, but the Romans could not conquer the red-haired tribes in the north of England called Caledonia. The English and the Romans tried to murder all the Britons, chasing them into the hills where they became Welsh, and Caledonia became Scotland, and the Roman and Scottish halves would not merge until the year 1707 with the founding of the House of Hanover. The capital of the Roman part of England had been called York, and England combined with Scotland was smaller than the state of Wyoming, and Hitler was from Austria that was the size of Indiana, and Rome had built an army camp in every conquered city, right in the middle of the town square with every city organized the same way so visiting Roman officers could find the post office and were able to get around without a map. The Romans had forced the English to quit being druids and become civilized by building roads and post offices so there would be no more painting themselves blue and dancing around Stonehenge. And after Rome fell to the barbarian Germans, across the English Channel, a kingdom gathered itself in Belgium and then split in two with half speaking a Romance language that became French, while the other half spoke Low German in the Rhineland. These were called Neustria and Austria, Austrasia, 
while the Schwabians stayed to themselves, as did all the other smaller Germanic groups, but the Bavarians considered themselves to be part of Austrasia, and the English still owned Normandy, even though it was in France. The French Napoleon was the first real attempt at democracy outside the great American experiment, and before Napoleon there were only kings and queens along with greater or lesser nobility, and no such thing as democracy had ever been tried before, including ancient Greece and Rome, because they kept slaves who could not vote. Government by election, rather than by birth, actually started in Germany with Frederick the Great's grandfather, who'd been the first to suggest the idea of a popular democracy, but these elections were limited to voting within an aristocracy, so the actual first free and fair democratic election in Europe, not counting the French Revolution because that was just a terror, was the election of the Nazi Party in Germany. When Hitler trumpeted his democracy of the National Socialists in Germany, it was actually true, and his party was enthusiastically elected in a free and fair electoral landslide. Napoleon had made the King of England stop using the title King of France in a peace treaty he made Britain sign in 1802, a treaty that gave Malta back to the Knights of St. John. And the interesting thing about the French who fled the terror to come over to America was that they were the only Americans to manage to truly blend. After Napoleon shot off the nose of the Sphinx with a cannon, he had to go home from Egypt on foot through the Holy Land because the British sunk all his ships, and the French in the Revolution might not have killed the King of France except that the Austrians had come foaming over the border to revenge the death of Marie Antoinette, who was the youngest daughter of Maria Theresa and her husband, the Holy Roman Emperor. The French had gotten the guillotine from their friends the Scots, and they took the guillotine on wagons around the countryside to purge France of all aristocrats, and thousands were killed by the rebellious rebellious mobs with their portable guillotines, and the French terror got rid of not only the nobility, but also of the authority of religion in France. What occurred next was a temporary reprieve in the process of downfall. The French Revolution was keeping Turkey's traditional enemies busy, and when Napoleon launched his Egyptian campaign, England hastened to shut France off from a route that might have led to India. Fodor's Turkey, 1985, page 74 and 5. The British were running poppy plantations in India that had been built by the British East India Company, and in 1869 the Suez Canal opened to bring the product more quickly to England and to Europe through the port of Antwerp. The best opium in the world came from Turkey, which was slightly bigger than Texas, and opium was worth more than its weight in gold and grew so easily in Turkey that it had become the unofficial national plant. A French scientist wrote in 1546, one century after the Moslems had chased everyone else out of Turkey, There is not a Turk who would not purchase opium with his last coin. He carries the drug on him in war and in peace. They eat opium because they think they will thus become more courageous and have less fear of the dangers of war. At the time of war, such large quantities are purchased, it is difficult to find any left. Opium, A History by Martin Booth, London, Simon & Schuster, 1996, page 25. The American Civil War, the Crimean War, and the Franco-Prussian War were all fueled by opium since the more war, the more opium was needed for wounded soldiers, and after so much death and disfigurement in the Great War, the poppy became its symbol. In 1910, the Germans had figured out how to get opium out of poppies using machines, simply by grinding up poppy plants and squeezing out the juice, and although this opium was not as powerful as that grown in Turkey, it was plenty sure good enough, so the balance of the opium trade had tilted towards Germany. 
Britain began blockading the shipping routes through the North Sea because their economy had become dependent on the trade of opium from the plantations in India, and the new German factories making cheaper opium were undercutting the price. Albert was sitting on the throne of Belgium in 1914, and Britain convinced Albert to stop the supply of opium through the port of Antwerp to force up the price, so Germany sent troops to free up the trade, and King Albert would return from England on the 22nd of November in 1918 to reclaim his throne. Albert's father had worked six million Africans to death in the Congo to produce rubber, and sometimes the Belgium owners wouldn't kill them when they worked too slowly, but would simply cut off a hand or a foot. And while the Kaiser called the fighting to get Serbia out of Albania, quote, the war for a few miserable goat pastures, close quote, he knew that Austria wanted Serbia so that a railroad being built by Turkey could be linked north to ship opium into Europe from the poppy fields in Turkey, cutting the British plantations in India out of the trade. Austria sent Franz Ferdinand down to see that the railroad went through, but he was shot in broad daylight as soon as he arrived, and the assassination broke up the Second Opium Conference. The Kaiser had begun building his Berlin to Baghdad railroad to bring poppy plants directly to his factories rather than having to contend with the British Navy, who were blockading the North Sea in 1905 to prevent the Russian Baltic free fleet from sailing to the aid of the Russian Pacific fleet being sunk by the Japanese in a sneak attack, and Turkey sided with Germany in 1905 because Britain was trying to shut Turkey out of the trade to keep up the price of opium coming from India. Serbia also grew a large crop of poppies themselves, and when the Serbian king and queen were assassinated in 1903, that turned Serbia into a military government needing access to the sea, and the Serbs had learned to be cruel after centuries of living under Turkish rule. The Turks were not Arabs, but had come from around Lake Baikal and went to the Balkans and from there into Turkey, and they had picked up Islam when they moved through Iran. The Arab displays his manly character when he defends his guest at the peril of his own life and submits to the reverses of fortune, to disappointment and distress with the most patient resignation. He is distinguished from the Turk by the virtues of pity and gratitude. The Turk is cruel. The Arab is of a more kindly temper. He pities and supports the wretched and never forgets the generosity shown him even by an enemy. Without having gone deeply into the subject, I am convinced that the Turks are the only branch of the Mohammedan faith which has never made any contributions to the progress of civilization or produced anything which, as Sir Edward Pierce says, quote, the world would gladly keep, close quote. They have been destructive and not constructive. The Blight of Asia, an account of the systematic extermination of Christian populations by Mohammedans and the culpability of certain great powers, with the true story of the burning of Smyrna by George Horton for Thirty Years' Council and Council General of the United States in the Near East, with a foreword by James W. Gerard, former ambassador to Germany, Indianapolis, the Bob's Merrill Company, 1926, Chapter 20 page 90 and 91. In A.D. 30, according to Kurtz, historian of the Christian Church, there were 500 Christians in the world. They had increased to 500,000 by A.D. 100, and they numbered 30 million in the year 311. The Blight of Asia, by George Horton, chapter 20, page 58. Thus says Sir Edwin Pierce. Edwin Pierce in his well-known history, quote, The new Rome of Constantine Augustus passed under the power of a horde of Oriental adventurers, Turanians by original descent, mongrels by polygamy. This was the greatest victory ever won by Asia in her debate with Europe. For many decades thereafter there seemed at least a possibility that the East might destroy all the fruit of Marathon. 
quoting again from the same author, quote, under the rule of its new masters, Constantinople was destined to become the most degraded capital in Europe, and became incapable of contributing anything whatever of value to the history of the human race. No art, no literature, no handicraft even, nothing that the world would gladly keep, has come since 1453 from the Queen City. Its capture, so far as human eyes can see, has been for the world a misfortune almost without compensatory advantage. Poverty as the consequence of misgovernment is the most conspicuous result of the conquest affecting the subjects of the empire. Lands were allowed to go out of cultivation, industries were lost, mines were forgotten, trade and commerce almost ceased to exist, population decreased, the wealthiest state in Europe became the poorest, the most civilized, the most barbarous, the demoralization of the conquered people and of their churches was not less disastrous than the injury to their material interests. This description of the condition of Asia Minor as the result of the capture of Constantinople continued down to the ultimate complete destruction of the Christians by the Turks. Nothing changed in the nearly five centuries that have passed. The Turk has not altered either in his character or his methods. The Blight of Asia, Chapter 20, Page 59 of him, the historian Butler says, The Goth might ravage Italy, but the Goth came forth purified from the flame which he himself had kindled. The Saxons swept Britain, but the music of his Celtic heart softened his rough nature. Visigoth and Frank, Heruli and Vandal, blotted out their ferocity in the light in the very light of the civilization they had striven to extinguish. Even the wildest Tartar from the Scythian waste was touched and softened in his wicker encampments, but the Turk, wherever his scimitar reached, degraded, defiled, and defamed, blasting with eternal decay Roman-Latin civilization, until when all had gone, he sat down satisfied with savagery to doze in hopeless decrepitude. The Blight of Asia, Chapter 28, Page 74, Chapter XXIX, Chapter 29, Page 74. But here we have the same old story. Baghdad fell into insignificance after it came under the sway of the Turks. At the time of its final capture in 1638 by the Sultan Murad IV, that monarch massacred most of its inhabitants, contrary to the terms of capitulation. The Blight of Asia, Chapter 24, Page 90 a great literature of commentary has grown up around the Koran, and it would be possible for its defenders to find much in its preaching tolerance, but its general effect upon its disciples, combined with the example of the Prophet's life, convincingly prove that Mohammedism is a creed to be spread by the sword. Written originally in Arabic, it is claimed for it that its beauties can only be appreciated in that language, and that the lines in which it is composed make a peculiar appeal to its readers and linger in the memory. This contention can only be understood, of course, by those who are versed in the Arabic. It was for a similar reason that Tupper's proverbial philosophy was at one time universally popular. I have read the New Testament in the original Greek, in Latin, French, English, and portions of it in German and Swedish, and I am competent to state that the words of Christ lend themselves to translation because of the beauty and value of the thought intrinsically, and because of the universal appeal in every age which it contains. The Blight of Asia, chapter 24, page 91. The Moslems had take over, taken over Spain, but were finally thrown out in the Reconquista that needed the Inquisition to get done. And Spain had to expel their Jews along with the Moslems because Jews were helping them since they got along better with Moslems than with Catholics. The Jews thrown out of Spain had been welcomed into Turkey, where they didn't have to worry about any Christians, because the Roman, the Russian Orthodox Pope had moved up to Moscow after Constantinople fell to the Moslems in 1453. The Roman half of Christianity had done a better job of keeping the Islamic terrorists out, mostly because the Prussians were good at maintaining a standing army in good stead.
and the Holy Roman Emperor allowed the Kingdom of Prussia to join with Germany in 1701 with its new royal capital at Berlin. While the British were founding their House of Hanover, and before that Prussia's capital had been at Königsberg with its fine port on the Baltic Sea. The first Holy Roman Emperor of pure German extraction had been Otto I, who was crowned in Rome by the Pope in the year 962, and the Turks would acquire the name Ottoman because Osman had been an Otto man when he took over Constantinople during the Hundred Years' War in the 1330s. Osman had come out of nowhere with his origin remaining a black hole in history and the Holy Roman Empire was more of a spiritual empire than an actual empire, and was called Roman because Rome had become Christian under Constantine, and the name meant to differentiate the Latin church from the Greek church that had more gold and could afford fancier churches and priestly garments and beautiful icons. After the fall of Rome, Opium had become less available in Europe, with only Jewish peddlers bringing it around during the Dark Ages, and the Crusades had opened up the trade again, but often the Crusaders had been beaten back by burning petroleum they'd called Greek fire. The German hero of the Crusades had been Frederick I, who was called Barbarossa, and Frederick Barbarossa was from the House of Wolf and Hitler originally gave his Operation Barbarossa the name Operation Otto in 1935, but the problem with Hitler's plan to invade Russia was that the Russians considered Constantinople to be the capital of the real Christian church kept alive by Orthodox Russians in Moscow, and the Nazis were making friends with the Ottoman Muslims and every Russian peasant knew Hitler's war was an assault on the sacred immaculate heart of Mary and her holy Russian Orthodox motherland. Catholic meant universal, while Orthodox meant correct, and Hitler changed the name of Operation Otto to that of the crusader hero Frederick I Barbarossa, because more people knew who that was and would be more inspired by Barbarossa than by Otto. With France and Britain's friend Austria on Germany's borders, there was nothing as important as becoming a soldier. And in 1913, Greece had helped Serbia wage war on the Muslim Ottomans in the Balkans. And while Bulgaria had helped Serbia in 1912, now Bulgaria attacked Serbia, and when this second Balkan war on Turkey had broken out, the Greek king had been assassinated in 1913, after which his son, King Constantine XII, took over, who was a friend of Britain. The British drew a line on a map, cutting off the northern part of Turkey, thwarting the railroad in that direction, and giving Turkish territory away to Bulgaria. So when Bulgaria and Greece were fighting in Serbia, Turkey took some of that land back, and England sent French and English warships to Gallipoli to seize the straits at Constantinople to stop Germany from completing their railroad in Turkey. Russia agreed to help Britain fight Germany in hopes of gaining some say over the straits leading to the Black Sea and to the Crimea, and the British had been using the Mediterranean as their own private lake ever since they'd sunk the Spanish Armada. While the Moslems were being thrown out of the Balkans, Italy moved into Tripoli and Turkey went into Jihad and started the Great War because Germany had been courting the Ottoman Turks in hopes of cooperating with them to build that railroad, the Opium Express. Italy helped the Allies in the Great War and would be given the lovely Austrian port of Trieste for their reward, and Tripoli was the capital of Libya and had been a major base of the Moslem Barbary pirates, and some historians said that the name Barbary came from the Berber people living there, but the name Berber had come from the Greek word for barbarian, and the Barbary coast had also been called Barbaria. 
the American warship George Washington had been boarded in October of 1800 by these Moslem pirates and forced to sail to Constantinople, and the crew were sold into slavery. The British had said they were helpless to stop the Moslems, so the Americans asked the French what they needed to take up the slack, and that was how Napoleon struck a bargain with the Americans and was able to return to France to fight Britain instead of having to invade America, his pockets stuffed with American money in exchange for the Louisiana Territory. As a result, Britain sat out the Congress of Vienna in 1814, unwilling to help France or anyone combat Moslem pirates with whom the British were trying to make friends so they would keep the trade route from India open. One of Washington's friends was Benjamin Franklin, the plenipotentiary to France and commissioner of American privateers in European waters, and Franklin said that if you survive a shipwreck, it is better to build a lighthouse than a church. The British Queen Victoria was of German extraction, and one of Victoria's daughters married a Prussian prince in 1858, and Victoria wrote 4,000 letters to her daughter in Germany, who wrote 4,000 letters back to her mother Victoria, and the prince's name was Fritz, and the princess was called Pussy. Victoria would stay on the British throne longer than any other before or since, and she also turned out the most children, and married them into all the royal houses of Europe, and she also gave them the gene for hemophilia, which would do more damage to the thrones of Europe than all revolutionaries could hope to imagine. When Pussy was young, she would beat her head against the floor and the Prussian prince and pussy gave the world a son named William II, who would grow up to be the Kaiser and lead Germany into the Great War. The birth of the Kaiser did not go well, with the Kaiser's right arm coming out stunted, although it might have been a congenital birth defect covered up by the story that his arm had become mangled during the birthing. And another version was that the baby had been laid wrong on his arm and nobody noticed it for three days. The Kaiser hid his stunted arm for the rest of his life and would pose sideways for the cameras and he had a special table utensil with a fork on one side and a spoon on the other, connected with a long handle so he could reach his food. The Kaiser would sit behind his desk using a saddle for a chair, and while he liked to gavot and minuet, he did not like to waltz or polka, and the Kaiser would outlaw the tango in Germany. The crown prince of the Austrian Empire, Franz Ferdinand, was sent to Serbia in 1914 to smooth the way for the Kaiser's Berlin to Baghdad Railroad. And there was already a railroad going along the coast towards Turkey from Greece in Salonika and Monaster, linked to Sofia, Nitsch, and Belgrade by a line passing up the Maritza Valley through Andrianople and Philippopolis, and up over a pass between the Balkans and the Rodo Mountains. Salonika was also linked with Uskub and Mitrovitska, but the British did not want the railroad to connect with the route going north from Constantinople, where opium could be carried across to Anatola, Anatolia and then into Serbia on its way to Germany via Belgrade. And in 1903, Turkey awarded the construction contract for the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad to a German company, while the English insisted it should be under international control. While a few hundred miles of track were laid in 1904, from Coney through Aragli to Boogaloo, an argument broke out about the railroad's final destination. The Russian Navy shot up some British fishing boats at Dogger Bank in October of 1904 that were laying mines to keep the Russian Baltic fleet from sailing out of the Danish Straits and coming to the aid of the Russian Pacific fleet being attacked at Vladivostok by the Japanese. And with the Russian fleet out of action, 
Turkey gave in to the English demand that the railroad be held internationally by giving Germany a 40% share, the French, Italian, Swiss, and themselves receiving a smaller ch share. A concession in 1908 extended the line eastward from Boogaloo across the Taurus Mountains to Adana, then 1,500 miles through Aintab and Berejik to Mosul, and along the right bank of the Tigris to Baghdad. The Suez Canal, built through Egypt in 1869, had cut shipping time from India to England by one-third, and the British needed Germany to obey their supremacy in the opium trade, and Britain's main goal in 1914 had been to keep the Russians from helping Germany interfere in the opium business. The British tried to seize the Russians' old holy city of Constantinople and occupy the Holy Land and cause trouble for the Russians in the Balkans, who'd been able to get along well enough with the Moslems, but now the Islamic world was getting worked up again about doing more jihad. Moslem riots in Egypt had brought in the British army in 1882, and the British had quickly gained control of Egypt and the Anglo-Egyptian War would result in British occupation of Egypt for the next seven decades, even though they pretended that the Ottoman Empire still owned the Suez Canal until 1914. The British had fought with Egypt again over the Suez Canal in 1896 and fought the Boer War in 1899 to protect the shipping route around the Golden Horn just in case they ever lost control of the Suez Canal, and poppy production in India had been cut in half after the dum-dum trouble, troubles, even though the Great War would make the British opium market boom again. There had been a first International Opium Commission meeting in Shanghai in 1909 to figure out who could sell opium, and 13 countries had sent officials but not Turkey, who just stayed home, and Austria also stayed away from Shanghai because they were using their lovely port at Trieste to buy directly from Turkey. Italy moved into Tripoli in 1911 and forced Turkey to sign the Treaty of Auchi in 1912 after airplanes were used to drop bombs from the sky for the first time against the Muslim Turks, who lost badly. Italy also wanted to buy opium directly from Turkey instead of from the British, and when the English king was declared Emperor of India in 1911, it brought on the Second International Opium Convention at The Hague, and Hungary and Austria again refused to attend, along with Turkey, who was busy building the railroad to ship opium into Europe. The big powers were already quarreling in anticipation over the spoils of a Turkish empire that as yet had not been completely brought to its knees. The big powers stood by as referees, chalking up the blows and picking up the pieces. There was an empire for sale. The various dependencies of the crumbling empire were getting restless. Both the Arabs and the Christians rejected Turkification. In 1911, war broke out with Italy over Tripa, Tripolitania, Fodor's Turkey, 1985, page 75 through 7. By 1912, the Muslim Turks controlled Serbia all the way to the Austrian border, and they'd been driven out of Hungary and Transylvania in the 17th century, and then chased out of Russia in the 18th century. And in the decade before the Great War, Turkey was being called the sick man of Europe. When twelve countries met for the Second International Opium Convention in 1911 to divide up the opium market, the Italians and the Turks had been fighting over the price for a year before Britain showed up in Turkey at Gallipoli. From February to March of 1915, English and French boats fired on Turkish forts, but lost two battleships each, the English Ocean and Irresistible and the French Bouvet and Galois, 
as well as a number of smaller warships, and the English and French were forced on shore to fight but failed to dislodge the Turks from their heights. In May of 1915, the Turks sunk the English Goliath, and two weeks later a German submarine arrived and torpedoed the English battleship Agamemnon in majestic and triumph. And in January of 1916, the English and French gave up and sailed back home. Russia had marched on Constantinople in 1877 to save Christians from being massacred by Moslems. And when the Russians got to within 30 miles of Constantinople, the British had sent the fleet to force everyone to sign the Treaty of Berlin in 1878, and that had made Serbia into a kingdom and given Bosnia to Austria and gave Cyprus to England. With Britain's gains, Russia marched into Afghanistan and was invited into Kabul, so Britain sent 50,000 soldiers and conquered Kabul instead, and the Afghanis responded by murdering their new English overlords, and the British withdrew in 1881. The Crown had bought the English Khedive's shares of the Suez Canal in 1875 for four million pounds, and Egypt was declared bankrupt by Britain and France four years later in 1879, and the British moved in to manage affairs for the Egyptians. Arabi Pasha led an Egyptian army of jihad against the Europeans but was completely crushed, and a Muslim militant from Sudan managed to conquer 11,000 Egyptian soldiers in 1883 under the command of three successive English commanders, and the Sudan War of 1896 lasted for three years and ended with Kishner taking over the entire Nile Valley for the crown. Britain wanted the railroad from Turkey to connect the Mediterranean with the Persian Gulf, so English ships could sail from India up the Persian Gulf, offload their product onto the railroad, carry it through Baghdad, and then across the northern coast of Turkey to English ports in Greece, or even closer, to English ports in Palestine. And they were still arguing when the Great War broke out, and in 1914, Turkey would side with Serbia. Russia had declared war on Turkey in 1875 to protect the Bulgarian and Macedonian Christians while the Bosnians were rising up against the Islamic Turks. And in 1914, Austria sided with Germany because the Austrians could buy poppies from Turkey through their lovely port of Trieste if only the British Navy were taken down a notch. The Austrians wanted Bosnia because it had always belonged to them, and the royal family liked to go there for vacations. And Austria's Habsburgs had been on the throne since the 13th century, and in 1848, in what would be called the Year of Revolutions, 80,000 Russians had marched into Hungary as a favor to Austria and crushed the commoner uprising in less than three months, and the Hungarian leaders of the communist revolution had escaped to Turkey. To keep Britain out of Turkey in 1914, the Ottoman Muslims turned to Russia for help while Britain made a deal with France about Egypt and North Africa on the 8th of April in 1914, and on the 4th of August in 1914, Britain declared war on Germany after the Belgians asked the Germans to protect them from the British preparing to land on the Belgian coast once again, something they'd been practicing for centuries. The French still wore red pants at the beginning of the Great War as they marched to meet the field gray Germans, and Russia started moving troops because whichever side got a head start would probably win. And by the end of 1914, half of all the Russian soldiers were either dead or wounded. On the opening engagement of the Great War, 3,000 guns fired for 10 days, with 5 tons of explosives ignited per square yard. 
The phrase battered landscapes entered into common speech. The Battle of Ypres was opened by the British firing a hundred and ten million dollars worth of ammunition. World's End by Upton Sinclair, New York, The Viking Press, 1940-1960, page 212. Hitler's unit was almost annihilated in the First Battle of Ypres, which went on for four days and stopped the Germans from reaching the sea. And out of 3,500 men, Hitler's group was left with 600, and only 30 of the survivors were officers. At the beginning of 1915, the British increased the draft because all the volunteers had been killed, and by the end of 1915, trenches had been dug for 350 miles, including the communication and support trenches, and steel helmets were issued to the troops in September of 1915. Mr. Fussell said that by the end of the war, there were in total 25,000 miles of trenches, enough to go around the world, and the trench soldiers had been given two tablespoons of strong dark rum every morning at breakfast with larger portions doled out before an attack. Before the Great War, Officers looked forward to engagement because those killed in action left slots for promotion. But before long, Britain was running out of officers. By the end of June 1916, Haig's planning was finished and the attack on the Somme was ready. Sensing that this time the German defensive wire must be cut and the German front-line positions obliterated, Haig bombarded the enemy trenches for a full week, firing a million and a half shells. At 7.30 on the morning of July 1, the artillery shifted to more distant targets, and the attacking waves of 11 British divisions climbed out of their trenches on a 13-mile front and began walking forward. And by 7 31, the mere six German divisions facing them had carried their machine guns upstairs from the deep dugouts, where during the bombardment they had harbored safely and even comfortably, and were hosing the attackers, walking toward them in orderly rows or puzzling before the still uncut wire. Out of the 110 who attacked, 60,000 were killed or wounded on this one day, the record so far. The Great War in Modern Memory by Paul Fussell, New York and London, Oxford University Press, Inc., 1975, page 12 and 13. After Verdun, which went on for most of 1916, the French army started to mutiny, and tens of thousands of them just went home while some stayed to sabotage their own lines. And the Germans heard rumors about the French mutinies but didn't believe it, thinking it was a trick, and some reports said that 60% of the mutineers were drunk. On April 9, 1917, the British again tried the old tactic of head-on assault, this time near Arras. The attack pressed for five days, gained 7,000 yards at a cost of 160,000 killed and wounded. The same old thing. But on June 7 there was something new, fi something finally exploiting the tactic of surprise. Near Messines, south of Ypres, British miners had been tunneling for a year under the German front lines, and by early June they had dug 21 horizontal mine shafts stuffed with a million pounds of high explosive a hundred feet below crucial points in the German defense system. At 3.10 in the morning these mines were set off all at once. Nineteen of them went up and the shock wave jolted Lloyd George in Downing Street 130 miles away. Two failed to explode. One of these went off in July 1955, injuring no one but forcibly reminding citizens of the nearby rebuilt town of Plurgsteert of the appalling persistence of the Great War. The other, somewhere deep underground near Plurgsteert Wood, has not gone off yet. His mines totally surprised the Germans, ten thousand of whom were permanently entombed immediately. 7,000 panicked and were taken prisoner. The Great War and Modern Memory, page 14 to 16. 
Hitler had been there at Arras. And then came the Third Battle of Ypres, and Ypres was twenty-five miles away from Tournai, and Ypres was fought mostly with new replacements. This time the artillery was relied on to prepare the ground for the attack, and with a vengeance. Over ten days four million shells were fired. The result was highly ironic, even in this war where irony was a staple. The bombardment churned up the ground, rain fell and turned the dirt to mud. In the mud the British assaulted until the attack finally attenuated three and a half months later. Price, 370,000 British dead and wounded and sick and frozen to death. Literally thousands drowned in the mud. The Great War in Modern Memory, page 16. Because the weather had turned for the Third Battle of Ypres in 1917, no airplanes could fly either to see what the enemy was doing or to drop any bombs, what few they could. And the previous battles had blown up all the roads and all the drainage ditches and canals, and so the mud had taken over the entire battlefield. The barbed wire through which the soldiers were to advance remained unbroken because the forward artillery had gotten stuck in the mud and the big guns would sink deeper each time they fired until only the barrel protruded and then the mud would swallow the artillery gun entirely. The Germans waited comfortably in their dugouts while the attackers became exhausted from fighting mud, and Third Ypres took place on the same ground where a quarter of all British casualties remained from previous fighting, and the British called the place Wipers. In March of 1918, the Germans gave it one last go, killing 160,000 to gain 1,500 yards. And the German advance took two weeks, and they reclaimed in an hour what the British had taken a year to possess. By July, the Germans were within 40 miles of Paris, and the last big battle on the 15th of July was at Reims, which the Americans pronounced Reims. The next major event was a shocking reversal. During the last half of 1917, the Germans had been quietly shifting their eastern forces to the western front. Their armistice with the Bolsheviks gave them the opportunity of increasing their western forces by 30 percent. At 4.30 on the morning of March 21, 1918, they struck in the Somme area and on a 40-mile front. It was a stunning victory. The British lost 150,000 men almost immediately, 90,000 as prisoners, and total British casualties rose to 300,000 within the next six days. The Germans plunged 40 miles into the British rear. The Great War in Modern Memory, page 16 and 17. The spectacular German advance finally stopped largely for this reason. The attackers deprived of the sight of quote-unquote consumer goods by years of efficient Allied blockade, slowed down and finally halted to loot, get drunk, sleep it off, and peer about. The champagne cellars of the Marne proved especially tempting. The German Rudolf Binding reports what happened when the attack reached Albert. Today the advance of our infantry suddenly stopped near Albert. Nobody could understand why. Our airmen had reported no enemy between Albert and Amiens. I jumped into a car with orders to find out what was causing the stoppage in front. As soon as I got near Albert I began to see curious sights, strange figures which looked very little like soldiers and certainly showed no signs of advancing, carried a hen under one arm and a box of note paper under the other, men carrying a bottle of wine under their arm and another one open in their hand, men who had torn a silk drawing-room curtain off its rods and were dragging it to the rear, men dressed up in comic disguise, men with top hats on their heads, men staggering, men who could hardly walk. By midsummer it was apparent that the German army had destroyed itself by attacking successfully. On August 8, designated by Ludendorff, quote, the black day of the German army, close quote, the Allies counterattacked and broke through.
The Great War and Modern Memory, page 17 and 18. The footnote 22 read, A Fatalist at War, translated by Ian F. D. Morrow, New York, 1929, page 209 and 10. The final score, oh, on the 29th of September, Haig broke through the Hindenburg Line. Bulgaria, then Turkey, then Austria capitulated. German peace overtures were proffered when revolution was sweeping over that land, when her admirals tried to send the fleet in a death-or-glory ride, the sailors mutinied. More alert to impending Bolshevism than to military defeat, the German government rushed a peace delegation to Falk on November 6. In Flanders Fields, the 1917 campaign by Leon Wolf, New York Time Incorporated, 1958, page 243. The final score in the Great War was six to ten, six dead Germans for every ten dead allies, and one out of every six people in Germany were now deceased for a total of 1.8 million. When Britain had been blockading the Danish Straits in 1905 to help the Japanese sink the Russian fleet, the German Kaiser went to work widening the canal joining the port of Kiel to the Baltic Sea to the port of Hamburg on the North Sea. When Britain had been blockading the Danish Straits in 1905 to help the Japanese sink the Russian fleet, the German Kaiser went to work widening the canal joining the port of Kiel on the Baltic Sea to the port of Hamburg on the North Sea, and the work was started in 1907 and was finished by 1914, and the widened canal saved 280 miles going around Denmark and avoiding the danger of the British blockading the Straits. The Kaiser Kiel Canal was 60 miles long and had first taken eight years to build between 1887 and 1895 using 9,000 men. And just before the Great War, the canal was now large enough to accommodate battleships. The Kaiser also founded several dozen Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes for the advancement of science, and one of them figured out how to put gas in metal canisters instead of glass ones, and they planned to use it on the Russians in January of 1915 for second Ypres. But the stuff in the canisters froze, and in April of 1915 they filled 5,000 metal containers with chlorine gas and fired them off in the early evening. And the gas attack left a four-mile gap in the front between the Germans and the English Channel. But there had not been enough German troops prepared to move forward to win the war because the gas attack had only been a test. Germany could have won the Great War at that moment and quickly, but now the mustard gas weapon was no longer a surprise a surprise, even though the secret had almost leaked out when an explosion in the lab killed a chemist. By May, the Germans figured out how to make mustard gas out of nitrate, but everybody was starving and they needed the nitrate factories to make fertilizer instead. Four months later, Hindenburg was put in charge of the army, with Ludendorff as his second in command and Hindenburg immediately ordered more poison gas since now they could use the nitrate fields in Alsace-Lorraine. And the British came up with their own poison gas and used it on the 25th of September in 1915, also with 5,000 shells filled with chlorine. But the wind shifted and blew most of it back onto the British trenches, and that happened at the same time Britain was losing at Gall Gallipoli. 
Thereafter, both sides began mixing phosgene in with the chlorine to make it deadlier, and for the Third Battle of Ypres in July of 1917, the Germans began using mustard gas that was not as lethal, but would blister the skin and lungs, forcing soldiers to care for the wounded rather than walking away from the dead. But mustard gas was not useful for advancing into an enemy position because it would settle onto the ground and remain active for days or even weeks. Over a dozen different kinds of weaponized gas killed over 90,000 people during the war, with more than ten times that many wounded, and over half of those deaths by gas were Russians. Upon autopsy, it was discovered that those who'd been exposed to mustard gas suffered 50% less lung cancer than those who had not been gassed, so doctors began treating lung cancer with mustard gas chemotherapy. Hitler was accidentally gassed in friendly fire and almost lost his eyesight, but to cover up the terrible shift of the wind that caused Hitler to get gassed, the doctors wrote that he had hysterical bl blindness. By the fall of 1916, Germany started using Belgian slave labor because they needed more German soldiers at the front to fight Russia and France and Britain. And the Germans arrested thousands of Belgians at Bayonet Point and put them on trains to the fatherland, and German raiding parties worked day and night to fill the trains and took 70,000 Belgians to German factories. When the Americans objected, the Germans replied that they were only doing these unemployed Belgians a favor, and other countries joined in the objection until the Germans gave up and let some of the Belgians go home, since they were refusing to work anyway. But when it came time to put Jews on trains to work in the factories during Hitler's war, there would be no protests from Belgium, and the hallmark of the Holocaust would be how easily it was accomplished. It wasn't only the French who were revolting during the Great War, but the Russians saw it through to fruition, and the winter at the end of 1915 had been one of the worst winters anyone could remember, and Russian soldiers were deserting from their trenches by the thousands and walking back towards home, stealing food from poor Russians along the way. By 1916, there was no food left in the cities, and Russians started looting and burning stores and farms owned by people with German-sounding names, even though they were actually Russians. In Germany, workers went out on strike in January of 1917 because their wages were being depressed by all the Belgian slave labor. And they also wanted to get along with Russia, and they wanted to support the Russian workers' revolution, and Hitler would never forget this betrayal of the fatherland by the communists right in the middle of the darkest days of the Great War. German workers wanted an end to martial law, and they wanted food, and they wanted to be able to vote out the nobility that was causing the war. Mr. Fussell wrote, that Longworth said on page 33 of the Unending Vigil that the class system derailed after the Great War when some British families found out that the graves in France would all be equal instead of higher classes getting separate burial pr plots from the common people. Before the Industrial Revolution, the world had been divided into the nobility and the commoners. Commoners or the landed gentry and the laborers, and when the countryside was denuded of peasants to muster into the army, Jewish bankers would show up to offer the king a loan to buy more soldiers. The Industrial Revolution had begun in Britain in the middle of the 18th century, and by 1848 it had gotten as far as it could in the face of revolutionary troublemakers who were reaping the benefits of the increase in material goods and food production that they now had enough leisure time to run amuck in the streets. A British bricklayer had invented 
Portland cement in 1824 that allowed London to construct sewers, and the name Portland came from the Isle of Portland in Dorset, from where the stone to make the cement had come, and the previous decade had seen gaslighting made possible by processing coal. The gas lights made nightlife possible and gave factories a 24-hour schedule instead of being confined to daylight hours, and steam engines and canal construction and roller mills for smoother railway lines made it possible to move goods around the world. And after 1848, business brought machinery and industry to a world that had had no middle class before. In the old days in Russia before the Industrial Revolution, serfs lived meagerly but not badly on their master's lovely estates, and while there were moments of terror, their being bound to the land was not such a bad deal, except when the Tsar's men came through to demand the eldest son report to serve in the army, from which they seldom returned and that would make the next son eligible for conscription. With sufficient money, the eldest son could buy their way out, but the amount of soldiers needed for the Great War put an end to that, and more often than not, all the sons were taken away. The Tsar Alexander II had given the serfs their freedom in 1861, after Russia lost the Crimean War and he emancipated them because he decided they were bad at being soldiers since they were nothing more than slaves. Now that they were free, the peasants were expected to pay taxes, and so Alexander II was assassinated in 1881, and Alexander III would persecute Jews who did not pay taxes since they were assumed to have money while the peasants had none. Alexandra Alexander III married the Princess of Denmark, whose sister was married to Britain's Edward VII, and they had a happy marriage with five living children, and their eldest was Nicholas II, who would become the last Tsar of all the Russias, when the Communist Soviets took over in 1917. Nicholas II married a German who was Queen Victoria's granddaughter, and when the Tsar Nicholas was murdered along with his wife and family by the communists during the Great War, Nicky's closest Russian relative had been Peter the Great's daughter born in 1708, the year after the House of Hanover joined Scotland to the Roman half of England to become Great Britain. Edward VII was Queen Victoria's eldest son, second in birth order after his sister, and Edward VII had six children, and his son George V was second in line for the British throne after his elder brother Albert Victor died in January of 1892 from the flu at age 28. And Albert Victor was rumored to have been the Jack the Ripper who killed and mutilated a dozen women from 1888 to 1891. When Albert Victor died, his younger brother, George V, was given the title of King Emperor and would be on the British throne when Hitler came to power in Germany. Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, had been a German who spoke in German with Victoria, and their eldest child was a girl who became the mother of the German Kaiser who would lead Germany in the Great War. And because their second child, Edward VII, was the father of George V, the Kaiser's mother and the King of England's father were brother and sister, and that meant the Kaiser and George V were cousins during the Great War. The Tsar of Russia was married to the daughter of Queen Victoria's third child, a girl who had married a German, so the Tsarina's mother was the sister of George V's father, and that meant the Tsar was married to the British king's first cousin, who was the first cousin of the Kaiser, who was the first cousin to the King of England, and the Tsar's wife carried her mother Victoria's gene for hemophilia to the Tsar's son. Edward VII's wife 
was the sister of the Tsar's mother, and Edward VII's sister was the mother of the Kaiser, and the Tsar's wife's mother was the sister of Edward VII, and George V's mother was the sister of the Tsar's mother, and his father was the brother of the Kaiser's mother. So when Hitler was fighting in the trenches during the Great War, the King of England and the Kaiser and the Tsar and the Tsar's wife were all first cousins. The House of Hanover had died with Queen Victoria in 1901, and the British monarchy had reverted to her husband, German line of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. And when Edward VII died in 1910, his son George V changed the family name to Windsor in 1917 due to the Great War. George V's father had been the uncle of the defeated Kaiser and the uncle by marriage of the murdered Tsar of Russia, and in toppling these competitors in the Great War, Britain rose to the peak of its power as ruler of the seas where the sun never set on its worldly domains. George V and the Russian Tsar Nicholas II shared a Danish grandfather, the father of Edward VII's wife, who was the mother of George V, and Tsar Nicholas II looked so much like his cousin George V that they had enjoyed dressing up in each other's uniforms. Alexander III was Tsar Nicholas II's father, and Alexander III and his Danish princess had always summered in the Crimea, in their Levadia Palace, where the Yalta Conference would be held in 1945. Alexander III's father, who had emancipated the serfs in 1861, had met Victoria when they were both twenty years old, and a romance had blossomed but their union was discouraged because Alexander III's father, Alexander II, was too important and wealthy to marry Britain's Victoria. Alexander I, the Tsar of all the Russias, had been both the King of Poland and the Grand Duke of Finland after the Congress of Vienna in 1814, and these titles were passed down to the next Tsars. When his son Alexander II freed the serfs in 1861, some things improved for the Russian peasants, but what they really wanted was a little respect. However, the nobles had lost so much in the, in the emancipation of the serfs that they began to treat the peasants with newly found contempt. To free the serfs, the government took large pieces of land away from the huge estates to give to the serfs in 1861, and government workers would come out to decide which part of the forest was to be cut down so villages could be built. And one baron's father had owned 10,000 acres and had 3,000 male serfs, while they didn't count the women and the children, and the government had taken half of his land. The commission marked the new border of the estate by cutting swaths in a straight line through the forests, and by establishing landmarks at the points where a straight line of the border changed direction. At these points, holes were dug in the ground and filled with rocks, forming bulky piles on top. In order to imprint for years to come, in the minds of the newly created free farmers, the new border of the estate of their former masters, the commission ordered the spanking of a half-dozen peasant boys of a neighboring village on every pile of rocks that represented a landmark. The result was that some fifty years later an old peasant could find without any difficulty the landmark where he'd gotten his spanking. Before the storm, a true picture of life in Russia prior to the Communist Revolution of 1917 by Baron Karl Raukosowski, Ventimiglia, Italy, Tipo Litographia, 1963, page 67 and 8. Both lakes Ostrovito and Krupova were known for excellent fishing, but since the shores now belonged to the peasants, it became impossible to prevent them from fishing at any time they pleased, mercilessly depleting the supply. Before the Storm, page 67. 
The Russian government took more land away from the big estates to give to the peasants to graze their cows. But the presence of cattle made forestry an impossible task. All the young trees were trampled and crushed. Before the storm, page 68. Instead of giving land to the peasants as individual families, the government gave land away to large communities that made it easier to collect taxes from the large collectives instead of from individuals. The collectives, or Soviets, were supposed to vote to elect their own leaders, and if anyone wanted to travel to another village, they had to apply to the Vol Volostnoy Starshina for a passport. The Baltic states divided up their big estates into family farms, and those people would resist the Soviet Revolution. But the Russian peasants had already been living with a sort of communism when the Reds took over, so the transition went more smoothly than with those who had been taking care of themselves. The land belonging to the barons in Georgia had also been given to individual families and had to be joined to the Soviet Union by force. Alexander II's father, Nicholas I, had led Russia in the Crimean War, and Nicholas I had inherited his Polish lands from his father, Alexander I, and there were two hundred thousand Jews living in their own isolated villages in Poland, and to pursue his quest to protect Russian Christians in Turkey, an ongoing military exercise that became the Crimean War. Nicholas I had forced the sons of Polish Jews into the Russian army, where they were required to serve for twenty-five years. The point was to convert them to Christianity so they would stop doing business with the Moslems with whom the Tsars had been at war since the Islamists first invaded the motherland. Nicholas I kicked the Iranians out of Georgia and Azerbaijan and Armenia, but could not conquer Turkey because he would have had to go to war with England and France, who were courting the Moslem Turks to keep the Russians out of the Mediterranean and Nicholas I sunk the Turkish navy in October of 1853, and Britain, France, and Sardinia joined with the Turks to fight Russia for the Crimean War. The British and French fleet laid siege to the Russian naval base at Sevastopol on the Crimean Peninsula, and the city held out for almost a year until forced to abandon Sevastopol in September of 1855 because Nicholas I had died of pneumonia and his son, Nicholas, his son Alexander II wanted to put an end to the Crimean War so he could focus on social programs in the Russian heartland. Humiliated by the treaty ending the Crimean War, Russia would be given back their Black Sea territory 13 years later by the victorious German Bismarck as a reward for the Tsar having stayed out of the Franco-Prussian War, which hadn't been too difficult for the pacifist Alexander II. And some gains had been made in Russia before Alexander II was assassinated in 1881 putting a swift end to Alexander II's improvements when his son, the next Tsar, Alexander III, concentrated on building up the military and bolstering the police, rather than bringing industrialization to the peasants, who comprised the majority of Russians. The motherland was simply peasant farmers as far as the eye could see. And Hitler said that Germans had glass windows while Russians were still using greased animal skins. And Hitler said that Germans rode motorcycles while Russians fed livestock. And Germans read books while Russians told folk tales. The Bolshevik revolutionaries took over Russia when the Great War with Germany had been going on for three years and many people thought that the Russians would fight even harder now that they were freed by the revolution, and that had been the purpose of sending Lenin on the sealed train since the Tsar had been failing to beat Germany. <laughs>